Okay, so this week um, we've been doing some head and neck stuff uh, with the second years and we were talking about the muscles of facial expression and we were talking about the branches of the facial nerve that innovate the muscles of facial expression um, and I just want to do a part of that today. Let's look at these branches in the face that innovate those muscles of facial expression because the facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, is very busy with lots of parts and lots of roles. So if we just function on one bit, we can do the other bits later. No doubt I've already talked about other bits of the facial nerve somewhere else, right? So last week, it was so busy in here that I got stuck into essentially a cupboard to teach, which was very beige and the lighting was awful and uh, last resort room. This week, there's nobody around. Everybody's gone home. Uh, we're in the Easter period. We still teach over Easter. We don't get Easter holidays. But right now, it's quiet, which is nice. So I've got the whole room to myself. I've got a lovely background, got all my models. Uh, theoretically, I can take as long as I want to talk about these branches here. So what I'm talking about are the somatic motor branches of the facial nerve that innervate these muscles. By muscles of facial expression, I mean these things that I'm using to express myself uh, and you know, to move my lips and that sort of thing. Not the tongue, um, not the muscles of mastication, not those, but the muscles of facial expression, the ones I used to, you know, pout and close my eyes and smile and bare my teeth and those things, right? Those muscles are innervated by cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve. Um, so we'll see where the facial nerve comes out of the brain. Uh, we'll remind ourselves of how it passes through the bone to get out of the skull. And then we'll look at what happens here. We'll look at the different branches and we'll see uh, the groups of muscles that they innovate generally, right? Um, and probably the most important thing is um, how this relates to stroke um, up and how you can distinguish an upper motor neuron lesion from a lower motor neuron lesion uh, by testing the muscles of uh, facial expression in your patient, right? And why one sign tells you it's an upper motor neuron lesion, the other sign tells you it's a lower motor neuron lesion. All right, because that's the bit. Um, students students uh, get the hang of the diagnosing thing, as long as they just remember it the right way around, but why it happens is quite cool. So this brain is probably gonna fall apart. Ooh. Ooh. We'll take the cerebellum off, right? Um, we'll take the blood vessels off, but right here, it's just going to, oh, we got it, I think. So here's the brain stem, there's the medulla oblongata, the pons, the midbrain is up in there, and then these are the cerebral hemispheres, right? Now, the facial nerve is a cranial nerve, which means it's a peripheral nerve. It's coming out of the central nervous system and going peripherally. And mo like most of the cranial nerves, it's, it's mostly doing stuff in the head and neck. And it has a, the reason, well, the facial nerve has got a lot of jobs. It's very complicated, which means that it's got a number of nuclei, a number of groups of cell bodies of neurons within the brainstem that it takes neuronal axons from, which it takes neurons from, and then they come together and they all run together to form peripheral nerve, right? Um, because it has a lots of different jobs. It has somatic motor jobs, uh, visceral motor jobs, parasympathetic, and it has um, special sensory, the anterior two thirds of the tongue job, um, and it has a bit of general sensation as well in the external ear, right? So it has a bunch of different jobs, a bunch of different nuclei contribute to forming the facial nerve within the brainstem. But what we're seeing here anatomically when we look outside the brainstem is, is in that little fold, that little crease between the pons and the medulla, we can see a couple of nerves appearing here. And those are cranial nerves seven and eight. Um, this one is a bit more medial. That's the facial nerve, cranial nerve seven, and the one next to it, cranial nerve eight, is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Now these two are gonna to run together for a little while, and they're going to... In fact, here's the, here's the thing. I don't know if anybody ever mentions this, but the facial nerve actually begins as two nerves. It has kind of like a, a main nerve, 
And then there's the nervous intermedius, or the intermediate nerve. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> Too much complexity, right? Um, you know, stuff you don't need to know. But the nervous intermedius is carrying a number of the facial nerve's fibres, right? So essentially we've got, I mean, this model just shows the one facial nerve, but really you've kind of got one big nerve and one little nerve running together. Nervous intermedius, cool fact. Right, so, the pons and the medulla are running up against the clevis, this slope here. So the facial nerve and the vestibulocochlear nerve leave the brain stem and then they pass into um, the internal acoustic meatus. So this canal, uh, and this, this canal is running within the petrous part of the temporal bone. And the reason we have this big rocky petrous part of the temporal bone is because the structures of the inner ear and middle ear are in there. So in there we have the cochlea and the semicircular canals and that sort of thing, right? Now obviously the vestibulocochlear nerve, that's its target cochlear and semicircular canals. It does its jobs with balance and hearing and stuff. The facial nerve runs with it and when it gets between the cochlea and the semicircular canals, it kind of hangs a left, it takes a bit of a right angle turn and then drops inferiorly through the skull. And it's gonna drop out of this foramen here. This is the stylomastoid foramen. Mastoid process is there, styloid process is there, the foramen in between is the stylomastoid. So that's where a lot of the facial nerve comes out of. But as it was passing through here, it's given off a number of branches. And those are the branches that run off and do different jobs. You know, like um, it'll, it'll run off uh, to, uh, well, it's gonna, you know, the cord of tympani is gonna carry taste sensation of the anterior two thirds of the tongue. It's gonna innovate the two salivary glands down here two on either side that is, um, it's going to innovate the nasal mucosa, it's going to innovate the lacrimal gland, right? So it's going, to, it's going to send off branches while it's passing around the inner ear and those branches are going to get out of the skull through various cracks and fissures to get, you know, into kind of these spaces here. But the nerve that we're interested in today, the somatic motor part that's going to innovate all of these guys, that drops out the stylomastoid foramen um, and then we are here, right? There's the ear, so you can palpate the mastoid process on yourself. Uh, so you get, so the facial nerve's in there. Now when the facial nerve comes out, it gives off this posterior auricular branch. That posterior auricular branch is going to, well, we've got a number of muscles here. Right. These are the muscles of the facial expression, but we've also got some muscles around the ear, yeah? Because we can move our ears. I can't move my ears. Right, we're from the same blueprint as a bunch of other mammals, right? We've evolved from mm, similar origins. Anyway, other animals, other mammals are really good at moving their ears, aren't they? Think about horses and dogs and cats and that sort of thing. So we've got these muscles that can move the external parts of our ear, except that they can't and we can't really. If you practice long enough, you can. Um, my father-in-law was very good at waggling his ears. <laughs> uh, so the posterior auricular nerve comes around here and innervates one of these muscles, but it also comes around to, this is the occipital region back here, right? And the, the scalp, the muscle running over the top, here is occipito frontalis. Sometimes it gets split into two or three parts, but for our purposes today we can say that that posterior auricular nerve is going to innovate the occipital part of the occipito frontalis. So it gives off that nerve, but then the rest of it goes into the parotid gland, but does not innovate the parotid gland. It just passes into the gland. There are some good embryological reasons for this. Um, have a look at the pharyngeal arches and, and so on, and that might shed some light on it. But the facial nerve enters the parotid gland, does not innervate it, but splits into five branches, and that splitting we might call the parotid plexus, and then those five branches leave the parotid gland and pass on to innervate the muscles of facial expression. Um, if you know which cranial nerve innervates the parotid gland. You might want to tell everybody else in the comments below. Feel free. Now, the, the five branches 
which leave the parotid gland are sensibly named. We have the temporal branch, the zygomatic branch, the buccal branch, and the marginal mandibular branch, and the cervical branch, classically described like this. So the temporal branch runs up to the temporal region. Here is my cheekbone, my zygomatic arch. So the zygomatic branch runs across that. This is the cheek buckle. So the buccal branch runs across the cheek. That's what buccal means. And then the marginal mandibular branch. Well, this is the mandible. So the mar marginal mandibular branch runs along the margin of the mandible. Although in some cases it does not. So if you are working in this region, it might be a little bit more superior or even a little bit inferior to the margin of the mandible. So watch out for that branch. And then the cervical branch runs down here. There are a whole bunch of mnemonics you can use to remember this. I'll leave that for you to look up because whatever works for you guys. Now, the muscles of facial expression then, we have, as I said, occipitofrontalis. Um, so the occipital part will raise the eyebrows and corrugate the forehead. Yeah, get the forehead creases. Um, and I'll do a follow-up video, I think, where we actually look at all of these muscles in detail. But um, orbicularis oculi surrounds the eye. So that is innervated by some fibres from the temporal branch and some fibres from the zygomatic branch. That's what lets you close your eye, which is a very important function because that takes care of the cornea and wipes tears across the cornea and so on. Um, and then we have some muscles here. We have, if this is orbicularis oculi, then this is orbicularis oris. Let you pout, pull your lips together. But we have a number of other muscles, labii muscles, uh, superior and inferior, which let you bear your teeth. And those then are innovated by the branches that pass there. We have buccinator forming the cheek um, and so on. So as, as the muscle, so this is quite logical. If you think where those branches run, the facial muscles that are there are innovated by those branches, right? Uh, the cervical branch runs down and innovates platysma, which is that uh, flat muscle there. So that's the anatomy of the facial nerve supplying somatic innovation to the muscles of facial expression. That's the loop out, the five branches and so on. Pretty straightforward. Now we get to the crux of the matter. Right, um, if we have a patient that has had a stroke, um, and often that stroke will affect the middle cerebral artery and will affect um, motor areas of the cerebral cortex up here, uh, one of the classic signs is drooping of the face on one side, and that's going to be on the opposite side. So if the lesion, if the stroke occurs on this side, the face is likely to droop on this side. And that's likely to be, um, you know, so they'll be, they'll be getting uh, weakness and maybe paralysis of the muscles of facial expression on the opposite side, but also likely weakness or paralysis of the muscles of the limbs as well, right? Um, but there's also Bell's palsy, which, uh, which occurs. Bell's palsy describes, um, well, it describes a number of conditions, but largely and generally, it's describing um, loss of function of that nerve somewhere around the stylomastoid foramen. This is sometimes maybe called, caused by a virus. It's not entirely clear what causes this. Um, there are likely to be a number of causes. So if we take the idea of a virus in an otherwise healthy person, um, inflammation uh, of the nerve as it's coming out of the stylomastoid foramen causes inflammation of that nerve and loss of function, which means that they get complete paralysis of the muscles of facial expression on the same side as the injury, right? And that means that all of the muscles on that side of facial expression become weak or paralyzed or lose function in some way. So the face sags, they can't, they can't bare their teeth, they can't raise their eyebrows, they can't crinkle their forehead, right? Problems, I mean, this leads to problems with, you know, you need your lips so you can move food around your mouth and so you can drink, right? Uh, but also so you can uh, um, move the food around inside your mouth. And if you can't control these muscles, then not only is food and fluid gonna leak from the corner of your mouth possibly, but also you're gonna get food collecting between the teeth 
and your cheek which you're going to have to clear out. Also more importantly with the eye because orbicularis oculi is important in blinking and the, so the facial nerve is involved in the blink reflex, the corneal reflex, right? If you touch the cornea you get yeah, the blink. Um, if that blinking doesn't occur then those tears are not wiped across the cornea, the cornea is not maintained, it isn't kept moist, uh, tears are likely to leak from the corner of the eye and there are going to be problems with the cornea, possibly. So that's Bell's palsy and that's the importance of, of, of these muscles functioning. Also they'll, you know, they don't have the obvious things, they won't be able to do the facial expression on one side, so they'll look a bit strange, one side will work fine, the other side won't. So that's Bell's palsy. Um, but if you have a patient with those signs, you also have to consider, is there another physical or medical reason why they might be suffering these symptoms? You know, diabetes could be a problem here. Uh, trauma to the head, so a fracture of the, of the uh, temporal bone could give the same effect. Um, lesions to the face because these nerves, these branches are quite superficial, they're quite close to the surface of the skin. Uh, you know, facial trauma might damage one of these branches or, or more than one of these branches, right? Um, or maybe there's a tumour, a tumour, a mass could be compressing on this nerve and causing the same symptoms. So you have to consider this anatomy and think about all of the other things that could be affecting the nerve. Now, the difference between the stroke and Bell's palsy type symptoms is that a stroke is an upper motor neuron uh, lesion whereas Bell's palsy would be a lower motor neuron lesion, right? And you can tell the difference in the two largely by the forehead. So, in your Bell's palsy patient, there's a complete loss of function on this side. They can't raise their eyebrow on that side. They can't crinkle the forehead on both sides. Um, so that's the nerve that's come out of the... Uh, i pick this up again. So, come on, brain. So the lower motor neuron then are the neurons that have left the brain stem. They've left the brain stem, they've gone through the skull, they've popped out here and those are the lower motor neurons, they've gone on to the, uh, the muscles, right? And that's what's been damaged in the lower motor neuron lesion. Now from here, that low, those lower motor neurons all carry on on the same side of the face to those muscles. Now with an upper motor neuron lesion, <laughs> So you have a patient, for example, who's had a stroke, but maybe it's something else. Something is affecting the motor cortex up here. Now these are the upper motor neurons, aren't they? Coming from the cerebral cortex and then going down to the brain stem and then they're synapsing with the various nuclei that the facial nerve gets its neurons from. So with an upper motor neuron lesion, now something interesting occurs. So I've got a good echo going on today. Most of the movements in the face are symmetrical. You think about swallowing, blinking, right? Smiling. Generally, we're pretty symmetrical. So that means that for most of the muscles in the face, pharynx, um, the, the impulse to move those muscles, for example, during a swallow, okay, it's still initiated, probably, sometimes, up in the motor cortex of the, of the cerebrum, right? Uh, and those upper motor neurons, they pass down to the, the brainstem, to where the nuclei are, the collections of nerve cell bodies, that the cranial nerves are going to come from. But those upper motor neurons from the cerebrum, as they come down, they'll often cross to both sides, right? so that both sides get innovated at once. So instead of blinking like that, you just, the blink is synchronized, right? So left goes to both sides and right goes to both sides. Still with me? <laughs> now with the muscles of facial expression, this occurs in some bits, but not other bits, right? So with the muscles of facial expression, um, the upper motor neurons from the left Mo the motor part of the left cerebral cortex. Um, some of them run down to the brain stem and they synapse with those nuclei in the brain stem that the facial nerves, somatic motor nerves are gonna come from. Now, the neurons that are gonna cause 
wrinkling of the forehead, raising your eyebrows. So the neurons that are going to uh, the occipital, sorry, the frontal part, the frontalis part of occipital frontalis, those upper motor neurons, they come down to the brainstem and they cross to both sides. So they, they, can, they can fire both nuclei on left and right sides of the brainstem, which then the left and right facial nerves will come out of and eventually innervate these muscles, okay? Now, inferior to the eye, that's not the case. It's a bit like the rest of the body. So most of the body, the, the motor bits on the left side, the upper motor neurons from the left side of the brain, they cross over as they go down, the, well, bef yeah, before they get to the spinal cord, and then the lower motor neurons will go out to the muscles on the opposite side of the body, right? That's what happens in, in most cases. Now, in the facial nerve, um, the, the nerves that are gonna innervate the muscles of facial expression inferior to the eye, now those upper motor neurons will start on one side, so say they start on the left, those upper motor neurons will descend into the brainstem and they'll cross over to the, the opposite side, to the right side. So they'll cross from left to the right side nuclei that the facial nerve is then going to send off its lower motor neurons from. And then they're going to innervate these muscles. Do you see what I mean? So what that means is that the muscle up here, um, the whole muscle gets innervation from both left and right sides of the cerebral cortex. But the muscles down here, right, these only get innervation from the left side of the cortex and these on the left only get innervation from the right side of the cortex. What that means is that if you have a patient who um, has paralysis or weakness of the muscles of facial expression on one side, uh, you get them to bare their teeth and all those sorts of things, but also raise their eyebrows. Now, if they've got Bell's palsy, they won't be able to bare their teeth and they won't be able to raise their eyebrows on the affected side. But if you have somebody with an upper motor neuron lesion, so for example, a stroke uh, on one side, then they won't be able to bare their teeth on the affected side, but they will still be able to wrinkle their forehead on the affected side. So then that becomes your standard method for diagnosing an upper motor neuron lesion from a lower motor neuron lesion if a patient has weakness or paralysis in their face. And it gets called, you know, forehead sparing. If they can wrinkle their forehead, then it's an upper motor neuron lesion because the upper motor neurons cross over from both sides to innervate both sides of this muscle. Whereas these lower parts, they don't cross over. All right, does that make sense? It's really, really useful and interesting. Tell you what's really interesting. <laughs> I'll tell you what's really interesting, and it's made me laugh as well. Um, you'll see why. Right, so if you have a patient with an upper motor neuron lesion, so the, the lower motor neuron parts, all these parts of the facial nerve work fine, but it's the upper motor neurons, it's the upper motor neuron, the link between the cerebral cortex uh, and the nucleus for the facial nerve that has been damaged, they, they won't be able to smile on one side, right? They won't be able to um, bare their teeth and you know, So if they think about smiling, if you say smile, they won't be able to smile, the face will sag on one side. But if something genuinely makes them laugh, right, a proper emotional laugh, they will probably smile. How weird is that? And that's because these nuclei of the facial nerve are also linked to the limbic system, the deeper parts of the brain that um, are involved with emotion and what have you, right? Because the muscles of facial expression are very much about expressing emotion. And a lot of the time we, well, most of the time when we're expressing emotion, we do it without thinking about it, right? So, so that's weird. If you see somebody that's supposed to be paralyzed, but they laugh and their mouth moves, that's cool. That is the link to the limbic system, bypassing the bits of the cerebral cortex. Fun fact. Okay then, there you go, that's it. Um, that's the part of the facial nerve, and there's five branches, and a little one back here, that innovate the muscles of facial expression, and why that's clinically relevant. Um, 
no doubt will hit the different bits of the facial nerve in different videos. I know I've done cranial nerves of the tongue, so it will have come up there. Um, don't know if I've done salivary glands, if I have, it'll come up there. Do you see what I mean? It'll come up in lots of different topics rather than hitting it in one go. There is another video on it that has an overview of the, of the cranial nerves themselves. Um, and then the muscles of facial expression. We'll look at those in detail another day as well, which will involve me making lots of funny faces, no doubt. All right. See you uh, next week.